We're winding up Ephesians. Once we get done with Ephesians, we'll do Easter. That's a shock. Uh, but then, uh, I was wondering what to do because uh, we've scheduled our vacation a little earlier this year than we normally do. So I, uh, I uh, had two weeks after Easter before I went on vacation, before I go on vacation. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about the book of Haggai. I tried to find a short book that we could squeeze in there. I, I didn't want to start something and then run off. Wait. Compilation oh, of, of things that I've done in the past. Blooper reel. Blooper reel. That would be fun. <laughs> that would take too long. <laughs> it would take too long. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously. One thing we forgot to mention is that uh, Gene is going to Washington, D.C. this week uh, on an honor flight. And so uh, we want to pray that he has a great time. And they don't lose the airplane. You're, are you flying Malaysia Air? <laughs> I'd be a little worried about that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, hopefully, your pilot understands geography better than the guy who made this slide. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed this slide, because this is the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, yeah, this is the Horn of Africa and, and Saudi Arabia and and it has nothing to do with Ephesus. I don't know what the guy was thinking when he made this. But I liked it. Did anybody else notice it besides? I'm covering up Ephesus. No, Ephesus is way off the map up here. Is it a, little, is it a wampus? Yeah, yeah. It's art. It's art. Art, you can do that kind of stuff. All right. We're talking about standing notwithstanding this morning. I'd like to start off with... Uh, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. I, I really don't know where he stands on the Supreme Court or which side he's on or who, he, you know, what, are, what are his rulings and everything. But I, I came across an interview with him uh, that I thought was very enlightening. He was giving this interview to a, I think it was called the New York Magazine. Um, and the interview was talking to him about a variety of things, and, and at one point, Mr. Scalia said that he believed in a literal heaven and hell, and that kind of shocked the interviewer, and then he went on to say, and I also believe that there is a literal devil. And <laughs> the guy is like, what? How can you possibly believe that? Where did we get you from? Uh, he says, uh, the guy said, you do? He says, of course, yeah, he's a real person. And then the interviewer said, have you ever seen evidence of the devil lately? <laughs> well, Mr. Scalia answered that question by saying, you know, I don't think that, that Satan uh, is absent so much that he has changed tactics. He has been very busy in our country and in our world getting us to ignore him and getting us to ignore God. And that's how he is working. And if you want evidence of Satan's working, it's the fact that we are ignoring him and ignoring God. And he has been fairly successful at that uh, task. I don't know what, what the interviewer ended up with, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, he was quite shocked uh, in this. And, and Scalia went on to tell him, you know, you are very out of touch with the majority of Americans who believe in God, who believe uh, in Satan, who believe that there is a literal heaven and hell, and that said, you just need to get in touch with the rest of, of the country here. Well, Paul now addresses all of his readers, and he wants us to stand firm against the devil. He wants us to understand that there is a literal devil. He doesn't go into a lot about, about Satan, but he wants us to be able to stand and he tells us that we need to be strong in the power of, of the Lord and in his mighty strength. And the reason that we are in, need to be strong is because we're engaged in a very spiritual battle. Uh, we are at war. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of us don't realize what kind of war we're in or what kind of weapons that we should be fighting this with. And uh, we get focused on all kinds of things. The first command here is to be strong. This is best understood as to be strengthened. 
It's not that we have power in ourselves. It's not supposed to, that we're supposed to build up our muscles. It's that we're supposed to be filled with God's strength. No matter how much muscle you have in your body or between your ears or whatever, you are never going to be smart enough or strong enough or spiritual enough in and of yourself in order to withstand Satan and any of his followers. You can't do it. You need to be strengthened by God. This fits a corresponding verse that back in chapter 3 where Paul prayed that you may be strengthened in power through his spirit. Paul has never said, go out and get strong. He's never said, go out and get exercise so you can just bulk up and you'll be able to do this. He says, you need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to be filled by the Spirit. You need to be filled with God's character. And God's strength will help you to withstand the wiles of the devil. We don't empower ourselves. Even if we are to obey God's, Paul's command, and we are supposed to obey Paul's command to be, to be strong, the strength still comes from God. You have your part to play. You need to, to accept the strength that God gives. You need to pray for the strength that God gives. And that strength will help you to, uh, to withstand what, what Satan does. Strengthening comes from an external source. And the following phrase indicates that that source is the Lord Jesus. Jesus has got the strength. And when Jesus gives you the strength, you don't have to be afraid of what Satan can do to you or anything that, that his helpers can do to you. Jesus is the person that has brought us, that we have been brought into union with. And because we have been brought into union with, in, with Jesus Christ, because we are in the Lord Jesus, we have strength. It's not ours, it's his. And when we start to rely upon our strength, we are going to lose the battles that we see and the battles that we don't. The reason why... Uh, is that we can be urged to be strengthened in him is because Jesus supplies everything that we could ask or think. Jesus gives us all the manner of strength that we could possibly use. The call to be strong has got a number of Old Testament uh, precedents as well. And again, they are being filled with what God can do, not with what they can do. Joshua was urged to be strong and courageous. He was urged to appropriate the strength that God gave him. David, too, found strength in the Lord. And finally, God says in Zechariah of his people that he, he brought back from Babylon, he says, I will make them strong in the Lord. All throughout Scripture, no one is asked to be strong. They are asked to be strong in the Lord. We are not supposed to bulk up our own muscles. We are supposed to incorporate his strength into our lives. The source of this strengthening, more specifically, is in his mighty power. And his mighty power is absolute in this world. He has all the power that we could ever hope or think. Now, this phrase about mighty power has already been used. Uh, it's the strength that God used when he raised Jesus Christ from the grave. And when he exalted him above every, uh, into the place of, of honor above every rule and authority. Way back in chapter 1. That's the kind of power that is available to us. Power that can raise someone from the dead. Power that can exalt that person to sit at the right hand of the Father. The Apostle also prayed that we would experience that extraordinary power working on our behalf. He wants us not only to know about it, he wants us to experience it. In the victories, in the problems that we have in our daily lives. And so he calls on us to do our part. We need to accept that power, to appropriate that power into our lives. That's your job. It's not to be strong in yourself. It's to accept the strength that he gives to us. We need a supplement. It comes from GNC. Uh, God's uh, necessary uh, 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 coverage. I don't know what GNC would stand for. Uh, God's spiritual power. We need a supplement. We have to have this. We cannot be strong in our own might. In verse 11, Paul goes on to explain why believers need to be strong in the Lord. Yes, you need to be strong, but why do you need to be strong? Because we are engaged in this deadly spiritual battle on the side of God against evil, an evil that is both personal and impersonal. And we fight all kinds of foes, external and internal. And we need this strength to come from him. Paul explains how his mighty power is supposed to be appropriated. 
He said, we have to put on God's full armor. This is our job, to accept the armor that he provides and wear that armor into the battle. It's not only, uh, it is only by putting on God's armor that we are going to be able to withstand what Satan does to us. That, and he, we might not even understand that we're being attacked. But if we have the armor of God on, it doesn't matter where the attack comes from or whether we're even aware of the attack. We have that power and God is going to protect us from those times. The expression full armor of, of God refers to the complete set of, of tools, both defensive and offensive weapons, that a soldier would have back in Paul's day. Uh, this is parallel to uh, something that, that Paul says about uh, the virtues that were mentioned in the fruit of the Spirit. This is not a complete list of the armor that is available to us. He is just giving um, examples of the armor that is going to be available to us. There are other things that we can do to prepare. And it's sometimes mentioned in sermons that there's only one offensive weapon in, in the armor of, of the Christian. But the, uh, a fully equipped soldier in Paul's day would have other offensive weapons as well. We have to have the full armor of God, everything that he provides for us in order to survive in this battle. He provides this armor. It is God's armor that he's providing, and really God is the armor. I've got this statement from somebody, and I liked it, because it is one of those statements where you say, I am standing, I am standing, I am standing. God provides the armor. He's the one who gives it to us. It comes from him, and it is his armor that he is providing, and that means that it is according to his character. It is according to his abilities, uh, and he provides that for us, and finally, it is he that is really the armor. God stands between us and our enemies. God surrounds us when we face the foe or when we even run away from the foe. God is our armor, and he protects us. And so this is the armor of God in many ways. The goal of us of our putting on the armor is so that we might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Four times, Paul uses the word stand or a variation of this word, stand. This is our goal. This is God's objective for us, to be able to stand when we are being tricked or when we are being attacked or when we are just being lazy, that we will be able to stand. This is the first reference to standing involves resisting Satan. It involves holding our position against God, against God, against Satan. I hope that wasn't a Freudian slip. Wiles, the word wiles there is all kinds of schemes. And it's plural because that suggests that these, these schemes that devil comes up with are, are of infinite variety. They are of infinite evil. And they come at us from all different directions. We might think that we have one thing figured out and Satan comes at, at us from another. We might figure out, oh, pool halls are bad, so well, let's go to the movie theaters. Oh, and then we figure out movie theaters are bad, so let's go rent DVDs. Well, then we figure out rent DVDs are bad, so let's get Netflix. Well, you know, Satan keeps coming. And his plans and his, his uh, schemes are constantly repeated and of infinite variety. One of my favorite illustrations is the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. They scare me to death. Uh, <laughs> although Matt goes, cool. <laughs> yeah, well, this guy was talking about velociraptors, and he says, yeah, it's not the one that comes at you this way that you have to fear. It's that they've got things coming in from the side. You're ready for this one, but they come from everywhere. Clever girl, <laughs> as he dies. Oh, the varied nature of this attack is also brought out when he talks about the evil one in verse 16 who launches his flaming arrows. This is not just one arrow aimed at you. These arrows are coming from all over the place. And they are coming at you fast and furious, and you need to be aware that, these, that this attack is going on. According to verse 427, Satan tries to gain a foothold over the, over the lives of Christians through uncontrolled anger. That's one of his arrows. One of his schemes through falsehood in verse 25, stealing in verse 28, unwholesome talk. 
And these are just a few of the arrows that Satan wants to shoot at us. We have to be aware of all of them. Evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It looks good. We have to understand the word of God so that we can understand where the trap is. We have to understand the, the word of God and, his, and rely upon the power of the Spirit so we can understand that some of the things in the world are only going to show that they are destructive at the end of the process. We have to be prepared for the battles that come. Without, good armor, without God's armor, believers are going to be fatally unprepared and unable to withstand the attacks of Satan. But this paragraph does not foster a fear, a, a, an attitude of fear. It's not saying we need to be afraid. I think there are tons of Americans, tons of Christians that are afraid, afraid of everything. And this governs a lot of what we do, but Christians are not told here to fear. We're not told that we need to go cower in the corner. We are told we're in a battle, but we don't have to be afraid. We're left not with a feeling of despair, but with a sense that Satan is going to be defeated, that he can be defeated in our life. This is what Paul is trying to get us to do, not to run away and, and be afraid. The basic reason for this is that, that Jesus Christ has already won the victory over, over Satan at the cross. It's a done deal. And Paul talks about it as a done deal. And we don't have to worry about it. When we celebrate Good Friday and when we, when we rejoice on Easter Sunday, the battle has been fought and won. And it's just a memorial service to the end of that war. The powers cannot finally hinder the progress of the gospel. They are all subject to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will bring all things under him. And we don't have to worry about the final outcome of this battle. We have to worry about the ongoing uh, progress of this battle. It's because of God's victory in his son that believers are in this battle at all. Um, we are not urged to win the victory. We're urged to withstand. The victory has already been won. But, you know, there, we still live in this present evil age, and because of that, there are battles that are being fought. But because the victory has been won, we don't have to be afraid. Christ is already seated in the heavenly places, far above all powers, and everything has been placed under his feet. We read that. That's an absolute statement of truth. Also, we have been raised and sit with him. That is a truth. If we are believers, that is the truth. We are already seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenlies. That means that this battle, however it's fought and, and whatever damage it causes us, cannot dislodge us from our place in heaven. It's already a fact that we are sitting there with him in heaven. But we live in this overlap between this present evil age and the age of salvation to come. And because of that, we must stand. We have to choose to put on the armor of God and to be part of this battle. We don't have to win. That's already won. That's already done. We have to be able to stand. Christians need to appropriate what has been won for them. Jesus Christ has died. He has been able to, he's able to give us all of, the, all of the benefits that he has. He, is, he can give us armor. And we need to stand firm in the overlap between these two ages. Paul goes on to explain why believers need God's mighty armor if we're going to stand firm. It's because the battle that is being waged is not against human foes, but against spiritual forces. This is why we need to put on the armor of God. Now, if it was just human beings, okay, well, then well, let's get out the vote. Let's uh, you know, give more, more money to help conquer hunger and, and poverty and, and disease, let's do some human things. Well, this is not the battle that we fight. The battle that we fight is much deeper than that. It is a heavenly battle. It is a spiritual battle against forces of, that have great authority. And because we fight against supernatural foes who have great power, great authority, 
great cunning, we have to put on the armor of God. We cannot fight this battle on a human level, on a purely human level. The word used to describe the struggle was commonly used of wrestling. There you go, Steve. You knew this, didn't you? You knew the Greek word for wrestle, didn't you? Well, at least you can't say I'm getting it wrong. <laughs> All right? Now, Paul, every other place, he doesn't talk about, when he talks about uh, athletics, he talks about running, he, you know, all those kinds. This is the only place in the Bible he talks about wrestling. Uh, it's a good deal. You should pay attention. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> it was chosen, okay, because I think it is this intense face-to-face, -face, you know, grappling. You are, you are wrestling with your enemy. You're not just, you know, slinging, you know, computer-guided missiles from a drone somewhere and, you know, lobbing them in there. This is a hand-to-hand -hand combat kind of thing. You know, this isn't, this isn't the javelin that, you know, those wimpy track people do. You know, this is latching on to your opponent and going at it. And I think this is what Paul wants us to know about this. It is a hand-to-hand -hand battle. It is an in-our-face. It is right here. It's not being fought in Washington, D.C. It's not being fought in the Crimea. It is being fought right in your face. And that's where we need to worry about the battle. Further, when he talks about the battle, he talks about it's our struggle. Whether we are Paul or whether we are those Ephesian Christians or whether we're Christians today, it is our struggle. We're all in this together. And because of that, we know that other people are there with us, helping us. In a, in a contrasting statement, he says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. It's not against humanity in its weakness and frailty. And we have lots of weaknesses and frailty. It goes much deeper than that. We are supposed to fight against a far more deadly foe who can only be resisted by spiritual weapons, through spiritual empowering. Now, Paul is not denying that we face very personal, practical human opponents in this world and that there are things that we, can't, that we, we need to do in this world. Perhaps even we fight against fellow Christians who, you know, want us to stumble for whatever reason or all kinds of things. But we have been warned, about, and we have been warned about being misled by people who seek to manipulate us through trickery or something. Okay, we, we not only fight the battle here, but Paul wants us to know that this battle is ultimately and finally fought on a spiritual level. Believers themselves, we have bitterness, we have rage, we have anger, and this is what we do. You know, and we, Paul's not saying that we don't fight against what's inside of us, because we do. That's really where the battle is being fought. But Paul's point is here is that this battle that we fight within ourselves, that we fight in this world, has, is a spiritual battle, and it has cosmic proportions. It is not only being fought here face-to-face -face wrestling, but it's being fought uh, far beyond this universe in a spiritual level. The ultimate opposition to the advance of the gospel is a supernatural power um, that uh, is under the control of the, of the God of this age, small g. Small g. In verse 11, it's the devil. Verse 16, he's called the evil one that is the opponent of, of believers. But here, in verse 12, there is a multiplicity of opponents. We fight against rulers and against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a vast, oh, I like the word panoply, a vast multitude of enemies that are out there after us. Now, the first two terms, rulers and authorities, we've already seen. Uh, and we've already been told that those rulers are underneath Jesus Christ, that he has already subjected uh, these two. The next one, the world rulers of this darkness, doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible and in any other contemporary Greek literature from that day. It's used a, a hundred years later than Paul, to talk about astrological and, and magical traditions. 
And so our thinking is, or that's not my thinking, the thinking of the people that do this kind of study, their thinking is, is that it is linked to demonic forces around the, around the world. Uh, and it is linked to those to supernatural powers. But there is a qualifying phrase to this of, of this dark world indicates that they belong to this present evil age, that they belong uh, to the darkness. But this darkness is something that we have been delivered from. They are not our rulers anymore. We are children of the light. And God wants us to walk as children of the light. The final description talks about the spiritual hosts of evil. And that is a very comprehensive term, talking about all kinds of, of evil folk. It talks about them being in the heavenly realms. They, you know, we're talking again, we're still talking about, about spiritual forces uh, in this world. These are not earthly beings. They are supernatural in, orient, in, in, in uh, nature, and they are evil in their very character. And although they are powerful, again, we do not need to be frightened of them. We have already been told in the book of Ephesians that Jesus Christ has conquered them and that they are subjected to him. We don't have to be afraid of these, of these folks, of these folks, of these beings. We have been given every spiritual blessing, every spiritual gift in heavenly places, we have been made alive and seated with him. Our struggle is against subjected powers, against powers that have already been defeated. We do not have to fear these, these beings. They may rule this world of darkness, but Christians have been transferred out of that realm. And so, yes, we need to be prepared and, and we need to stand, but we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid. Now, there are four beings mentioned here, and there were three mentioned back in, in chapter 1 about categories of, of demonic spirit, spirits. And I think that it, Paul is not trying to list for us, um, a uh, give us a, a uh, what do you, would you call that, a hierarchy of beings. He's just talking about a lot of different spirits out there like he talks about a lot of different ways of being attacked, like he talks about a lot of different ways of, of schemes and wiles and arrows. There's just a lot of enemies that we have out there. The relationship of these beings to Satan is, up to spec is, is very speculative. Uh, they are his allies. It talks about them being belonging to the darkness and the spiritual forces of evil. Yes, these are satanic in nature, but how they function we really don't know. The assumption is, and I got another quote here, that they have a common nature. They have a common objective and method of attack. And that necessitates the idea that we have to rely on Jesus Christ or we will not survive. We have to stay in the light. We have to put on the armor of God or we will not be able to withstand them. If we think that the Christian life is just a matter of human effort or exertion, then we have misread the nature of this war. If we think that all we have to do is uh, vote and protest and, and elect the right officers, and we, we don't know the war. We don't understand the war. We need to understand the scriptures. We need to pray. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. We need to put on the armor of God. There are other things that we need to do, but that is the basis and basic things that we need to do. Many Christians seem to be unaware that there is a war in progress, or if, they, or if they think there is a war, it's fought on purely human means. And so they do purely human things to, end, to, to fight this war. This is not the war that we fight. This is not the war that Paul is warning us against. And if we use entirely human resources, we will not win. And we will not even understand that we have lost. Only spiritual weapons are of value in this deadly struggle that we are involved in. Therefore, he urges us again, put on the divine armor. Put on the armor of God that you might be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Once again, the purpose is so that we might be able to stand. Now, here in this verse, he talks about standing twice. He says, first we need to withstand the devil, and then we need to stand. 
the time when believers are to withstand the devil is in this present evil day. We've talked about that before. We are supposed to, we're living in, the, in these times when the days are evil, and so we have to make use of every opportunity, every opportunity to learn more about Jesus, every opportunity to pray, every opportunity to witness in this world. That's where we fight the war. That's where we fight the war. Paul is not only speaking of, of this present age between the two comings of Jesus, but he is also alerting that, us, that, that there's going to be all kinds of, of tactics that Satan will use. There may, may be times when, when it, we are living in a, a very peaceful time. You know, and it might lull us into a false sense of security. But Paul wants us to know that the war is still being fought, and it's far from over, and it is not an easy war to win. Not an easy war to fight. The war has been won. Finally, it is crucial that when believers have done everything, that we stand firm. The Roman centurion was expected to guard one square yard of territory, to be able to stand on that spot against all comers, against all odds, and to defend his spot. He is supposed to stand firm in that place. And that's what God is asking you to do. He's asking you to stand on your spot and defend that spot against supernatural powers. When we have done everything, made every necessary preparation, are fully armed, God expects us to stand. After the Christian is strengthened by the Lord, after we've done that, after he has filled us, we put on the armor, then we are going to be able to stand against all the things that God has done. That's a nice little kitty, isn't it? Can you see him? He's a mountain lion ready to get you. Um, I can't remember his last I can't. I was, there was a guy, I think his name was Billy Quick. And Mr. Quick was a naturalist. He liked to go out in the forests and, and, and research, and, he, and his, his job was to do research in the woods. And one day... He came across a little pond, and he saw a mountain lion drinking at this little pond. Well, he you know, stands back, doesn't move, you know, waits for the mountain lion to finish. And the mountain lion eventually gets done and, and then takes off into the, into the brush. Well, then Mr. Quick thinks, okay, it's, it's my time. Um, and he goes down to the, to the pond, and he fills up his, his water bottle, and, and he's getting ready to, to, to leave. And he looks up, and he sees two eyes looking at him. From, from the brush. And this mountain lion knew he was there, had left and come back, and now was hunting him. So he stands up very slowly. He's looking at this thing, and this thing, mountain lion, comes out of the bush. And he, you know, he doesn't make any move. He doesn't have any weapons that he can fight against this mountain lion. And he, he just stands there and looks at it. Well, the mountain lion stops. And then he makes a little rush. And Mr. Quick realized that mountain lions usually like to hunt from the rear. They will get their enemy to run, their prey to run, and then they will jump on their back, knocking them to the ground, or latching their jaws around their neck and snapping their neck, severing their spinal cord. They like to come at you from the rear. They like to come at you when you're running. So Mr. Quick says, I, I can't run then. I can't do this. And this lion would make lunges at him, trying to get him to bolt, trying to get him to run. And he just stood his ground and stood there, looking, staring down this thing. And finally, the, the mountain lion gave up and, and took off because he couldn't get Mr. Quick to run. This is what we need to do. Satan makes these little rushes at us. He tries to get us to run. He tries to get us to be afraid. He tries to get us to, to solve this problem in our own power. But we face an enemy and that we need to stand up to. We need to look our enemy in the eye and say that we are going to follow the Lord. We are doing this in His strength, in His power, putting on His armor, and God will protect us. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you again for the armor that you give to us, for the strength that you give to us. And Lord, we pray that every time 
our government or our world or whatever does something that we know you do not approve of, that we would realize that basically, fundamentally, finally, we have to rely on spiritual weapons, on truth, on the Word of God, on prayer, on the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that those are the weapons that we would use to call our world back to you. Lord, we pray that we would be able to withstand the slings and arrows of this world. Lord, we pray that we'd be able to stand the rushes that Satan put, throws at us, and that in the end, we would stand. In Jesus' name we pray.